In this video, I want to review with you some of the major rhetorical moves and elements that many writers tend to include in their discussion section. So we're nearing the end of our in-red format. Yay. So let's try let's take a look at the shape that goes along with the discussion section, which I like to call the it's a triangle shape. And remember we talked about I talked to you about the hourglass shape for the in-red. You have the intro here, methods and results, we get very specific, and then here this is the discussion section. So we're moving the opposite direction from very specific to very general. And those rhetorical moves reflect that. So you start with a specific result of your study, explain how they answer your research question. It's usually the first thing you want to do right at the beginning of your discussion section. You're going to continue by supporting your conclusion, and you do this in different ways, and we'll review some of those moves and some of those elements in just a moment. You do want to defend your conclusion, and this means that you're going to anticipate criticism. And this has a lot to do with pointing out the study's limitation and justifying why you did things a certain way, because your reviewers and editors will point that out. So it helps to anticipate that. And then you're also going to um, need to describe the overall implication of your work, uh, the big picture of the study. And that's, of course, the bottom of the triangle, the broadest, and it comes towards the end of the discussion section. So either if you're writing or reviewing um, somebody's empirical work, those are the things to pay attention to. I included this slide here from a, a class that a colleague of mine teaches at Stanford University, Professor Sainani. She does a wonderful job. Uh, the course is called Writing in the Sciences. It's a Coursera open access course. So if you're ever interested in taking that on top of everything else you're doing, it's wonderful. I've actually gone through it several times. Um, I really enjoyed it. A lot of my material is very much modeled on her material as well. So you get a lot of overlapping information. So it's really good reinforcement. So take a look at that. I also, um, I'll, I'll link to uh, the video, um, this video in this module, but I'll also link in all our uh, supplemental material to the University of San Francisco writing comments, USF writing comments, that includes all of Professor Sainani's videos on writing in the sciences. So you don't have to go to the Coursera website. It's really, they're really wonderful videos. So if you have a chance to look at them, do so. I'm including some of them in recommended sections throughout this class as well. And I think one is actually required in your last module. But anyway, enough said about where this comes from. So let's look at what this slide actually says. So here's a great template structure for the way most discussion sections are structured. As I said, writers usually start off with the key finding, and it's the answer to the question, and, I'm, and it's really important to use clear language, like we found that. And you'll see this in some of the discussion sections that we're going to analyze together in the videos. Um, you want to explain what the data mean, big picture, you're already foreshadowing that, um, and you know, state something if the staff findings are novel. Um, so you are you are very specific and very narrow. Again, the triangle triangular shape. Thinking about that, but you do allude to some of the larger context if that's appropriate. If you have secondary findings that are also important, you're going to mention them here as well. And then what a lot of authors do, and what you know, is if you're writing an article, it's really helpful to do to provide a very rich context for what these uh, these results mean. Remember, the interpretation analysis is reserved. In traditional in red format for the discussion section. So here you give possible mechanisms or pathways, compare your results with other people's results, discuss how your findings support a challenge to the paradigm, and anything that falls into that kind of narrative, into those kinds of rhetorical moves. You do want to point out strengths and limitations. That's really, really important. Don't ever shy away from pointing out limitations of your study. There's nothing wrong if you don't have a perfect study. And there's nothing wrong with published material to have limitations. You have to be transparent about them and be very, you know, and, and clearly indicated to you that those to your reader, that's your job. Um, in addition to strengths and limitations, it's always a good idea to include something about what's next, any recommended studies to confirm these results, or any unanswered questions, future directions, maybe something that came up throughout your research process. This is a good time to mention that, sort of, again, moving into that broader direction of the triangle, right? I feel my triangle in the corner. Um, the so what? Um, big picture implication, um, any kind of um, implications of the basic science findings. And this is really a time to tell your readers why they should care. So this is great, especially when you're thinking about communicating with not just the scientific audience, thinking about what's the major impact of your result, what are the major impact of your results. 
And ending with a strong conclusion is always a good idea. You can restate your main finding, give a final take-home message. Some authors don't always do that. You might find some texts where there is a, a clear conclusion might be missing. Some texts actually include even the heading conclusion or conclusions. That's possible, but not always done. Depends to a certain extent on the format of the journal if they ask the authors to do that. But not all articles, as I said, end with a conclusion. They might end with a big picture, and that might be, conclusion, might be the conclusion. There are different conventions in different journals and disciplines as well. But you do want to end your, um, your, your discussion section with some sort of overall statement, if it's just restating the overall impact of your results, and leave your reader with like a larger thing, a larger connection to the, to the larger implications of your work. So let me review some of other some rhetorical moves in sort of an, in order they would appear in that triangular structure of the discussion section. So some of this will overlap with some of the things we've already seen. But I do want to give you some language because this is some of the language you can use for your writing assignments as well, for your analysis of either two different um, methods and results sections, or when you're writing your if you're submitting your own work um, in a paragraph where you are explaining what moves you've used. So again, you present a key finding of the study, it's always, or key findings, if there's more than one. Um, this helps to differentiate your study from existing work, and please make sure that you actually clearly state that. Provide the context for the study's findings based on previous work in this area, that's, you can do this right at the beginning as well. Differentiate your study compared to previous studies. This is very similar to what you do right with your key finding, but you can again do that later on as well. You don't want to be too repetitive. But if there's other, if there's di different ways how your study is or compares to previous studies, you can bring this in a different elements. Because here we are at the tip, these first two at the very tip, and here we're moving already a little bit broader. So this is a space for differentiating your study compared to previous studies. Um, also, uh, you can use this in the broader network, in the broader part of the, of the discussion section. And this is particularly useful to connect back with you to your introduction. Um, if you've mentioned some studies in there, it might be a good idea to use these to differentiate your work against, so that there is it's almost like a mirror image between your introduction and your discussion. They're not going to be the same, but it's nice if there are some connections. Um, often, actually, and you'll see this in Ainsley's article, Ainsley's article, I think it's maybe pronounced the name, that I assigned for this week's readings. If you haven't read it yet, you will um, come across this information. He actually gives an example of a uh, of an article where the last sentence of the introduction is almost identical to the first sentence of the discussion section. And that's okay. It's okay to remind your reader, hey, my research question was, and guess what? This is how we answered it. Okay? So moving on to the broader, um, broader part of the triangle, explain how your study fills the existing gap in the research, confirms previous research, and or expands existing paradigms in your field. Again, you're picking up some of the narratives, some of the conversation you started having with your reader in the introduction section where you first initially started showing the gap. So you return back to this again, mirroring a little bit what goes on in the, what goes on in the introduction in your discussion section. List the limitations of your study. That's really a broader spectrum uh, type of rhetorical move. Really, really important. Don't skimp on this. Um, connect to a larger conversation in the field. Um, that's you know something that you do throughout, but especially in this broader part. Explain implications for the greater good, the big picture, why right? you leave off with that, or you really leave your reader off with it at the end. And if you have any avenues for further research that you have to think of, you can suggest them as part of your conclusion as well. Okay? So um, I'm going to review one discussion section with you in here, and then the next video, part two, we'll review a different discussion section. This one here is from the article about the TZDs published in Drug Safety that we've looked at for the previous sections as well. So let me go through this uh, through this with you, almost sentence by sentence. And you notice that I've taken I didn't. This is a couple of, I think about three or four slides that have parts of the of the discussion section in here. It's not the entire discussion section. This one is actually fairly long. So if you see these signs right here, I've taken out some of the um, some of the text in there just for readability and going through this. Your handouts have all of this stuff on there. So if you don't have them in front of you, and you can follow on the screen, but it might be nice to have it next to you as well. So first rhetorical move right in sentence one is the differentiating the study from existing work. These authors actually start off with that. So they don't start off with the key finding. They start off with like, hey, in, in a way they are giving a finding because they're saying it expands this, but they do it in, by comparing it to existing work and differentiating their work. 
And it, it's the study by Lips Combat L that they use, which actually was, if you think back of the introduction, if you look back at it, if you have it in front of you, it's cited and referenced in the info as well. Then in the second sentence, um, the authors present a key finding of the study. Using a large nationwide yada yada yada. Um, we found, right? There is that language. We found, we found, we found. Very, very clear sentence. I have no question in my mind about what their findings are because I know exactly where to find it. And then in the third sentence, the authors connect their study, their, their findings to the larger conversation in the field. Our analysis was consistent with recent studies, and here are the citations. And I bet you that those citations appear already in the introduction to a certain extent. And then the last sentence here um, presents the big picture of the study. Again, this is something that you can do already early on in the intro, even though it is usually, it really gets focused on at the, at the uh, end of the discussion, right, when we look at it more broadly. But this kind of foreshadows that. So these findings provide additional valuable information to clinicians, patients, and the public regarding the safety of PVDs. So you tell your reader why they should care right from the, from the bat. And then the second paragraph, um, the authors start to provide this rich context for their results. So here in the sentence, although some studies have investigated, blah, 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 they have certain limitations. Uh, previous so the limitations of other studies, right? The context, why they were doing the study and why their result is so important. They have certain limitations. Previous clinical trials have done this, yada, yada, yada. So that's really the, you know, the context for the study finding based on previous work in this area. Then the authors continue with, continue with differentiating um, their, uh, their current study as compared to previous studies. However, our observa very clearly our observational study found that only a very small proportion and so on. So this is again their finding in the context, larger context of the research on this topic. And then the last part of this paragraph again continues with the context for the study's finding based on previous work in the area. So this entire paragraph really uses previously published research to highlight what is so remarkable about their findings. Super important a rhetorical move that you authors do throughout their, for a large part of their discussion section. So a lot of it comes from that kind of, um, from that impetus. We continue then after short, you know, taking some things out, um, where the authors move towards, um, you know, actually they continue with uh, presenting the unique contributions of the study, differentiating from existing body of research. Our study is a population-based observation or cohort study by focusing, and they focus on a slightly different aspect of their findings. By using nationwide data, we were able to do this. This allowed a more in-depth and thorough study design. So again, and then they also explain how the study fills the research gap. Um, in addition to rosy glitter zone, we've identified between this and this. This were included in our research design to, com uh, to enable comparisons to be made with TZDs. Um, this is more real-world relevance and comparisons using placebos right here. So again, a lot of language around how their study is different, how it fills the gap, and it's so you could explore the extent of prescribing for drugs concerned and so on. This allowed a more uh, in-depth and thorough study design, right? So this is the gap that was existing that they're filling. And then um, uh, continuing in the discussion section, I think I've taken some parts out here as well. Um, here the authors go clearly in the limitations. And look at the first sentence. It couldn't be clear. This study is not without limitation. Ta -da. And then they do this thing that I love. First, second, third, and I think there's two more that I've taken out because you get the picture. Clearly organized. So first, this is one of the limitations. Second, this can occur. Third, blah, blah, blah. Even though we adjusted for this, we were not able to include. So these authors are very open about what they weren't able to do. But when they do this, for example, here they hedge it or they, they put it in a context like, hey, although we did this, it was still not it was still impossible to do all of it, right? So they are saying we've done the best we could, and that's really what reviewers and editors are looking for in these sections. Limitations exist, but it's about presenting them in a really clear, transparent, and justified way that makes a big difference. And then at the end, these, this discussion actually includes a conclusion section. Right, so it's clearly labeled conclusions, and um, here the authors um, provide this big picture summary of the study. Despite limitations, a study of a nationwide diabetic population, blah blah blah. Overall, it's always a great word for conclusion. The kind of the point is, and so on. Um, need for further research. Um, they present this as part of the conclusion, however, suggests a non significant association. Then the sentence here this indicates an area where further research is needed. 
Um, and then at the end again, they could continue with the big picture summary, our findings, extend the evidence from current literature um, to a real world setting and support data from clinical trials of disadvantages or harms caused by TBDs and so on may outweigh their benefits in patients with type 2 diabetes. So basically, big warning, it's, you know, it confirms it, this should not be done. Right? So it really is, it's a very well organized discussion section um, and it really does a nice job in clear language, clear markers, like overall, earlier with the first, second, third, to help the reader stay organized while they're reviewing and reading the sections.